And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early, when had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for, for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone that had been rolled back was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee, that you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to every, anyone, for they were afraid. Do you want me to use this mic? Yeah. No worries. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this could be funny. With two broken fingers, it could be funny. So. Um, I think it's worthwhile just remembering the the context that Mark writes his gospel. Um, scholars say that he's effectively writing the recollections of Peter in his old age. Uh, and a key theme of Mark's writing is all about discipleship. And, and when he wrote this, his, I guess his key audience were those who were in Rome. Um, because the timing of this was after the great fire of Rome, where as a result Nero blamed the Christians, and a huge persecution came upon the church. And it's perhaps difficult for us to imagine just how hard life was being a Christian in the Roman, um, in, in the Roman Empire in those days. It could be difficult for us to perhaps imagine what that was like, the challenges that that brought to life. But um, just a book I've been reading, there were um, just a couple of instances. I just wanna, the Romans were very good at, uh, at persecution. Uh, they really did um, do a good job at it. I just want to read a couple of stories just to give you an idea of the, the life that people were living when Mark writes, uh, when Mark writes this book. Uh, and he wanted to encourage them, but this is what he wanted to encourage them about. There was a, the story of an unnamed woman who had been converted out of a pagan background. She wanted her husband to embrace the new faith with her and so gently tried to persuade him to become a Christian. But he persisted in unbelief and immoral behavior, so she filed for a divorce. Enraged, her husband brought charges against her in a Roman court, claiming she had left him without his consent. He also mentioned that she was a Christian, which was probably the more serious charge. He then singled out her pastor too, holding Ptolemus uh, responsible for her conversion. So Ptolemus was also arrested. And after being tortured for some time, Ptolemus was brought before a Roman judge, Urbicus, who asked him just one question, are you a Christian? And when he confessed that he was, Urbicus ordered his execution. Then another man, Lucius, also present in the courtroom, stood up and protested the judge's arbitrary and unfair judgment. What is the charge? He has not been convicted of adultery or fornication or murder or any crime whatsoever, yet you have punished this man because he confesses the name of Christian. Urbicus replied, I think you too are one of them. Lucius responded, Indeed I am. And so he ordered Lucius' execution too. Just astonishing the sort of lives that they faced and the, and the persecution that they, they came up against. There's a, another story here about... Um, a guy called Polycarp, who was known as the Bishop of Smyrna, um, which is in uh, modern-day Turkey. Um, and the story goes that there was a mob which had already put several Christians to death, started to call for Polycarp's death too, for he was a well-known leader in the, in the region. His friends persuaded him to withdraw from the city, and he complied, finding a place to hide in the country. Writing, account, uh, writing a story of the account of of this in the fourth century, um, there was th this was what was recorded. There were there he remained for a few with a few companions, devoting himself night and day to constant prayer, 
to the Lord, pleading and imploring, as he had always done, that God would grant peace to the churches throughout the world. Officials eventually hunted him down, transported him to the city, and ushered him into the arena, where a large crowd began to call for his death. As the account reads, a voice from heaven cried, Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. The proconsul pre pressured him to deny Christ and swear to Caesar, but Polycarp refused. For 86 years I've been his servant, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Swear by Caesar's fortune, the proconsul shouted. If you imagine that I will swear by Caesar's fortune, as you put it, pretending not to know who I am, I will tell you plainly, I am a Christian. The proconsul threatens, I have wild beasts. I shall throw you to them if you don't change your attitude. Call them. If you make light of the beast, I will have you destroyed by fire. The fire you threaten burns for a time and it is soon extinguished. There is a fire you know nothing about, the fire of judgment to come and of eternal punishment, the fire reserved for the ungodly. But why do you hesitate? Do what you want. Polycarp, Polycarp has confessed he is a Christian, the proconsul announced to the crowd. This fellow is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods, who teaches numbers of people not to sacrifice or even worship. Enraged, the crowd called for his death. They bound Polycarp to a stake, stacked wood around him and set it on fire. Meanwhile, Polycarp prayed, I bless thee for counting me worthy of this day and hour, that in the number of the martyrs I may partake of Christ's cup to the resurrection of both soul and body. Just amazing. That's the persecution. Uh, that's, the, that's the treacle that, that they had to, to work through. And that's who Mark's written his gospel for. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just astonishing to think about it. And yet he wrote this gospel and he captured Pete, what Peter remembered of, of his time with Jesus. He captured it so that it would be an encouragement to those around him. And so he's written as well as an encouragement to us. And in the passage that we've read today, we read about four disciples. There are four disciples in this passage. And I think they're there to help us and to instruct us, for us to learn from, just as they were for those in Rome. And the first three were three women. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. And in the passage we just read, they are introduced to us as being at the crucifixion. In verse 40 it says they are looking on from a distance. And then verse 41 it says they had followed him through Galilee and ministered to him. And there's some really simple sentences there, but they, they are full of, of fascinating insight, really. Now, verse 41 says, When he was in Galilee, they followed him. So, their disciples, they are following Jesus. But I just want you to stop and think about what did that mean? What did that mean for those three women to follow Jesus through Galilee? You know, when they went through Galilee, it wasn't like, you know, a visitor ministry team that might come to New Zealand today. You know, fly in on a jet, you know, rock up to the church that's hosting them, get billeted out with people in the church, you know, and have all their meals sorted out and maybe be taken out for a nice meal along the way and a nice venue like this in which to speak on. There was, there was none of that for these three followers of Jesus, these three disciples of Jesus. No. While they followed Jesus across Galilee, they walked hundreds and hundreds of miles. Literally hundreds and hundreds of miles. They did it in all weathers. Rain, storm, blistering heat. They followed Jesus. They climbed mountains and they probably got into pretty dodgy boats and went across the Sea of Galilee, which was you know, known for its squalls. Sometimes... They had no roof over their head. Sometimes they found themselves in hostile towns and villages where literally they were chased out. And they did this for three years. 
They had been on the road for three years following Jesus with only what they could carry. Their following Jesus was so much more than just a decision of, well, I'm going to follow Jesus and just carry on with my life. No, no, they went on a journey that completely transformed their lives. And it wasn't easy. It was a difficult journey. Not only that, it says also in this verse that they ministered to Jesus. What did that look like? Because after a long day on the road, and when they got to wherever they were going, it's probably these three women had to go and buy the food and probably cook the food and then serve the food to the men and then clear up afterwards. And then they'd be up early the following morning, they'd be preparing breakfast for everybody and the provisions for the day. They ministered to Jesus as well as following him. And it was hard work. I'm sure by the end of three years they were exhausted. And here we are, then we find them at the cross, standing, watching on, in what would have been a really hostile environment. You know, the people, the, the crowds were baying, had been baying for Jesus' blood. They are hurling insults at Jesus. And these three women are still standing there, watching the one they have followed, the one they have ministered to be butchered, on a cross. Quite amazing, really, as disciples. You know, they're standing there, standing there at the cross. All the, all the men have disappeared, of course. Judas, Jesus has, has, has betrayed Jesus. And Peter has denied Jesus. Everyone else, with the exception of John, we're told in other Gospels that John is there, but the rest, they're nowhere to be seen. But these three women, these three women are there. And they stand as, a, I guess, a wonderful picture to us of what faithfulness looks like. What steadfastness looks like. These three, they are... They are immovable. They are, they're not going to stop. They're not going to stop. They're not even going to stop here. They're going to they're watch when Jesus' body is taken down. They're going to watch where he's buried. Uh, they're going to go on, on, on Sunday morning. They're going to go and they're going to anoint his body. They're not going to stop. Utter faithfulness, just wonderful faithfulness being displayed by these three women. I think it's good for us to be reminded that actually that's, that's part of the calling on us as disciples, to be faithful. I think there's a risk sometimes that we, I mean, it's good that we remember that God is faithful to us and that God ministers to us, but there's always a risk, isn't there, that, that actually that's all it is. Actually, there's, there's a requirement as us, as disciples, to be faithful to him and to minister to him. You know, Mark is writing this and he's thinking about who he's writing it for and, and all that they're suffering, all that they're going through. That, you know, the fact that if you confess to be a Christian in that day, you could be killed. And that's not the same for us. There are different pressures on us. There are pressures on us to fit in, to be part of the crowd, to be the way that the world works and goes. We're, there's pressure on us to put ourselves first. Have you noticed that in our, in our culture today? It's about putting ourselves first and, and looking after ourselves as number one first and foremost. We, we live in a society now where faithfulness is not that valued, actually. You know, you don't have to be faithful to your employer anymore. You can go and have a, a dozen jobs a year. That's absolutely fine. No, no, one, no, one, no one values faithfulness in the way that it used to be valued. And so it's great to be reminded by these three women that faithfulness is part of being a disciple. We are called to be faithful. And just while I think about that, I just want to acknowledge, I just want to acknowledge those of us who, who minister to Jesus amongst us. I just want to acknowledge the setup teams that set up and break down the hall for us on a Sunday. I want to just acknowledge the welcome teams. 
I want to acknowledge the children's workers who are out there right now. I want to acknowledge our worship teams. I want to acknowledge our elders and their wives. And I want to acknowledge the wider leaders in this church and our trustees. Because all those people are being faithful. They are being what a disciple is all about. They are being faithful. They are ministering to us. And as they do so, they are actually ministering to Jesus. And for those of you that do that, well, his word to you today is simply this. Well done, good and faithful servant. So we're called to be faithful as disciples. It isn't easy sometimes. It isn't glamorous sometimes. It can be really hard work, but we're called to be faithful. The fourth disciple that we're introduced in our passage is Joseph of Arimathea. And we're introduced to him in verse 43. And it says he's a member of the council, which means he's a member of the Sanhedrin. Okay? And... The way that he's described, apparently scholars say, that means that Joseph was prominent, he was well-known, and he was powerful within the Sanhedrin. And we might read that and go, whoa, hang on a minute, what's the, what's the story here? The Sanhedrin, uh, aren't they the ones that have opposed Jesus all the way through his ministry? Uh, weren't they the ones that, uh, that put the trumped-up charges to Pilate? to have Jesus crucified? Weren't they the ones that stirred up the crowd to get the crowd to shout crucify Jesus and to release to them a terrorist? Wasn't, wasn't that them who did that? Well, yeah, it was. It was. And, so, and yet it's really weird. So we're introduced to Joseph of Arimathea and, and he does some what seems to be some pretty strange things here. But in verse 43 it says, he was looking for the kingdom of God. In fact, Matthew and John in their Gospels, they declare that Joseph is a disciple of Jesus. So we'd have to assume he's a pretty secret disciple, probably. We've not heard of him before. He has, doesn't appear to have stood up and, and fought Jesus' corner prior to this point. But nonetheless, he is a disciple. And what we see him do, well... We see him do two things. First of all, he breaks rank with his own group. He breaks rank with his own people. And this is huge. You know, I'm pretty sure that the Sanhedrin would have preferred to have had Jesus left on the cross. In fact, that was a, that was a Roman custom. As a, as a warning... As a deterrent to others, they would leave a body on the cross for days, maybe even weeks, as a deterrent to those who might want to challenge Rome. And I'm pretty sure that the Sanhedrin would have preferred that that's what would have happened. But he breaks ranks and he goes to see Pilate. Just think about that. He goes to see Pilate. He asks Pilate for the body of an enemy of Rome. And it's likely probably that Pilate was probably a bit suspicious of Joseph. It's highly likely. In fact, it's interesting. He says, well, is he dead already? And has to, the centurion has to confirm that Jesus is dead. I wonder whether in, uh, I wonder whether in Pilate's mind, uh, what's this guy up to? You know, is, does he want to get Jesus off the cross early just so he can, he can take him away and revive him or something? But no, the, the centurion says, no, no, he's dead. And so what do, we, what do we learn from Joseph as a disciple? Well, I think we learn from him one simple thing. That being a disciple of Jesus takes courage. It takes courage to be a disciple of Jesus. To stand against the, the, the predominant view of your own people. To speak to authority. To put Jesus first. All that takes courage. It takes courage. We've been so valuable for the first readers of Mark's Gospel to know that. It's important, it was important for them in the first century to know that they needed to have courage. It's important for us in the 21st century to know that we need courage to be the disciples we've been called to. I can't help but wonder sometimes that the narrative of our own day is not that um, Christianity should be left to hang on the cross to rot. I feel like it sometimes feels like that. In the face of uh, 
the, the, the view of our day, of the voices of our day, of the stance of our day, you know, will we have the courage to put Christ first? That's a question I think we need to ask ourselves. Will we? Will we have the courage? And will we be faithful? So we're presented with four, four disciples. They demonstrate for us faithfulness and courage. And I just want to think about for a second that they did that. They did that in the events on a Friday in Jerusalem and very early on a Sunday morning in Jerusalem. And when we think about the God, when we read the Gospels, we see that the disciples, they really struggled to understand what Jesus was about. They really did struggle to understand why he was alive, what, what his real mission really was. There was still this sense of he was there to overthrow uh, the Romans. That was really the, the thought that was still stuck in their head because that was the popular view of what the Messiah would do in their day. And so these disciples have been faithful and they have been, uh, uh, and they have had courage and they've done it with that sort of mindset. But what they're about to discover, what the, particularly the three women were the first to discover, was that Jesus didn't jump to to defeat the Romans. Jesus came to defeat death. That's what he came to defeat. And in, ver in chapter 16, verse 6, three words, probably some of the most important words in the whole Bible, where the person sitting inside the tomb says, He is risen. He is risen. So vital. On the cross, Jesus defeated our sin. But as he rose from the dead, he defeated death. It's crucial for the gospel. It's crucial to us as disciples. And it's crucial for us, if we're going to be faithful and if we're going to have courage, the fact that he is risen is crucial to us. And I guess if you want to think about just how crucial it is, there's probably no better place uh, to look than in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians when Paul is writing uh, to the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One Corinthians chapter 15, one to, we're starting 1 to 5. Paul writes this, he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So Paul reminds the Corinthians that this is the gospel that he's preached. Yes, Jesus died. Yes, he was buried. But yes, he was raised from the dead. And then he goes on to explain later in the passage from verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. Wow. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, we are most to be pitied. That's how vital Christ being raised is. So vital. 
so vital. And then just to finish it off, if he sort of rounds it off towards the end of the chapter. From verse 50, he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Imper Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this bo mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortal, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When I read that, I then think about actually what Lawrence shared a bit earlier. That actually we already know what happens at the end. We will be raised. And, and, and so when we think about being faithful in the difficulties of now, when we think about having courage in the difficulties of now, I, I, I use this analogy. It's a bit like, and I won't use last night's game as, as an example because that would be a poor one, but it's like, it's like you know the result of a game of sport you know the result before you sit down to watch it. And if your team has won, if you sit down and watch it, it doesn't matter what goes on in the course of the game because you know what the final result is. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. You sit down and watch a game live, you know, and you're on the edge of your seat or you're standing up or you're pacing backwards and forwards. How is this going to end up? And you feel that nervous energy and you're not really sure. But when you know the result already and you sit down to watch it, you're relaxed, you know. You can have your glass of Coke beside you. You can eat your chippies. Yeah, because you know what the result is. It doesn't matter that the other team's 15 nil up at this point because you know you're going to come roaring back and we're going to win. Well, that's what, it, that's what Paul is saying here. That's what Paul's telling us. Yes, it's hard to be faithful in the moment, but the reality is we know what the final decision is. We know what the result is. That's, that's what can encourage us to stay faithful. That's what can encourage us to have, be courageous in the situations in which we find ourselves. And Paul finishes this, he finishes this section, he says this, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Our faithfulness is not in vain. It's not in vain. Our courage is not in vain. It's so good. Those, those three women chasing for three years, they didn't know that. They didn't know what was going to happen. They, sort of, they, they trusted Jesus, but they really didn't know what was going to happen. Neither did, just, neither, neither did Joseph. But we do. We do. And we're encouraged. We're encouraged to be faithful. We're encouraged to keep pressing on, even though it feels like we're walking through treacle. You know, we live in a world that has changed. Things that we once took for granted, we can no longer do. There are challenges that we face globally. There are challenges that we face nationally. There are challenges that we face regionally and locally and there are challenges that we face personally and they're difficult and they're hard just like they were in Rome but in the midst of that Jesus calls us to follow him he calls us to be faithful and he calls us to be courageous and I just want to finish with one uh, last a few verses of scripture and then I think Kate if you wouldn't mind coming back we might just sing um, again but Paul writes this in Romans chapter 8 if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. When uh, we were driving to church this morning, Claire and I, as we do as our customers, we were just praying for the service and just felt myself praying, you know, this morning we've spent time in God's presence. It is a picture a reflection of what it will be like one day in glory when we will be before him you know with his physical presence there with us worshiping and glorifying him and that's that's the result that's the that's the end of the game that's when it all gets wrapped up put away and put in the box that's that's the end of it because he rose because he rose we have a future and we have a hope. And it's a glorious one. And his call to us as his disciples then is to be faithful and to be courageous. I'm just going to pray and then perhaps, Kate, we can just worship again. Father, I just want to thank you so much. Lord, that we have such a great crowd of witnesses down the ages that 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 call us on in you. Father, I thank you that for each one of us, Lord, that you've broken into our lives, Lord. Lord, that you have dealt with our sin and that you have defeated death. I thank you for that this morning. Father, as you call us to be your disciples, as you call us to be your apprentices, Father, I just pray, will will you remind us Lord, of what you did on the cross. And will you remind us what you did when you rose from the dead again? And Father, will you help us in our generation and in our day, Lord, with all that surrounds us and all that we're facing right now, Father, will you remind us that you call us to faithfulness and you call us to courage. And Father, I thank you that you've put the same spirit in us that raised Christ from the dead. Lord, to live in faithfulness and to live with courage.